Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Innovation Conversation. Today, we are joined by Jane Fisher. Jane, welcome. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. Jane, you have a, a very interesting life story, a very interesting uh, business going on. So would you like to tell our audience a little bit more about it, please? Sure. Well, I'm a first-time founder, um, so it's uh, quite a rocky road, but we're learning and getting there. Uh, we're working on an AI assistant for immigrants, which is an app that guides you through settling into a new life in a new country, hopefully saving you hours and days of uh, fruitless search through lots of online communities, asking complete strangers for advice and hoping that you're not going to get scammed, uh, saving you from lots of unplanned and often unneeded expenses and just general stress of relocating to a new place. And how do you get started with this idea? Well, I'm an immigrant born and bred, so I was born to a family of immigrants in Japan, and over the course of my own life, I immigrated a few times, so I have quite a lot of experience, and in one of my immigration journey, I, I had a coordinator me through the process, tell me where to go, what to do, which documents to bring, who I could speak to in my native language if I needed to solve a problem. So that was a game changer. And in my other immigration experience, actually to UK, even though I've lived here before and I studied here before, I just did not realize how difficult it is to change countries where an, an adult with some sort of a settled life where, yeah. where you come from. And navigating it by yourself is just extremely difficult because there is no walkthrough. There is no you know, checklist of the things you want uh, you, you need to do. And even if you do Google any of them, mostly they're not particularly that elaborate or they're quite generic. So unless you are very well connected in the local immigrant communities, and even that, again, doesn't save you much time just because there is too much information to look for in process and a lot of it is, is subjective. Um, it's just quite a pain and it takes yeah. month and month to get your life back on just normal track. I'm not even talking about improving it. When I, when I was ready to quit my job at the startup that, that I was working for before, and I realized that actually the only way forward for me is a person who wants to make a difference in the world and, uh, actually be sure that I'm moving towards the direction towards the impact that I want to make was to try to make something of my own, to build something of my own. And my sweet spot has always been healthcare and public health and health tech, but my career path just does not yet make me an expert that can build something in that field. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, okay, where can I leverage the skills and expertise I already have while also making a startup, a tech business that would make the world a better place and help people. So that's how I kind of landed at this idea, which would be simply digitizing one of my previous immigration experiences with the power of AI, which is now mm -hmm. got much easier than ever before. Mm, nice. And how are you finding the journey? Because you're a first time founder. So how is it? It'd be wild or? Um, a lot of people ask me what it feels like to build something in this uh, current climate when raising this one is difficult and so on. Honestly, all I have to say is I'm my own biggest obstacle in all of these things. Had it not been for my own insecurity, my imposter syndrome, my lack of confidence, I think we would have been much further along. I can't blame the current economic climate for making it hard for us to raise because I haven't properly started our fundraising because all the talks we've had so far have been through solely through warm intros and they're all pretty reassuring. So it's just me being shy and not confident enough to ask for money <laughs> that's really been the obstacle so that's why we ended up um just bootstrapping so far and and decided to focus on pushing the you know, traction a bit more so that basically not just to be more appealing to investors but for me to feel more secure <laughs> to ask for that money i guess that's where we're at, at the moment so it's been the experience has been wildly different from working for a startup that had investment, which was my previous experience. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I cringe so much at some of the things that we did at that previous startup where I wasn't a co-founder, I was just an employee. Just how many things you realize were so deeply wrong when you bootstrap me. But it was someone else's money, right? So Yeah, fine. but the, the thing is, when I think of all the money we burned through and how we burned it, how many things should have been done in a completely different way that's what and and, and especially when i think of my own uh, 
attempts to be useful in the startup and to, and to fix things. Most of that wasn't my job at all. And, and thank God I was try, still trying to do that, even in the wrong way, because that's mm -hmm. what brought me to where I am now. That's what equipped me with knowledge how things are not supposed to be done. And that's what made me the right hand to the founder in some way. And that's where, that, that's what, well, again, brought me to the point where I am now being of a completely different non-tech background. My background is communications and journalism. Never in my wildest dreams I imagined myself building a tech startup. Um, yeah, anyway, being a bootstrap founder without the money, without investment, it's a very enriching experience. And even if mm -hmm. I do end up not building what I want to build or not making it the business I want to make. If I am ever forced to come back into full-time employment, I'd say I'm on a very different level of expertise in business than I was before I started. Now, how are you finding like learning all these new skills on, on the job, literally, right? Because <clears throat> you need to make a lot of decisions on where to take the company, uh, which tech uh, to build. So how are you finding all that? I guess you just learn by doing, right? So in our case, it's both our blessing and a curse that we don't have the money to make expensive mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's easy in the sense that we're not taking any loans or anything. Um, so we're playing it safe. And uh, if it doesn't work, well, it just doesn't work. That means we're just doing things slower. And mm -hmm. if it does work, then you know, it does work. And we just continue exploring and learning other things. Of course, it's very confusing because there, there is a lot of content and information out there to consume. The more you do this, the more you realize there is no playbook that would be teaching you if a certain way of building a startup is right or wrong. Because yes, there are some best practices and yes, there are some worst practices. But at the end of the day, it's a lot about luck. It's a lot mm -hmm. about... Uh, just uh, connecting certain dots. And sometimes you may end up building a successful business and, and raising millions while having a completely wrong business model and, and completely wrong way of thinking. Or you can do everything right and still go bust because, well, that's the way things are or that's the way the economy freaked out at the time when you were building a business. So it is quite a, quite a journey and quite a, an experiment. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to be philosophical and chill about this because I'm not losing anything at least. Yeah. Trying out different things. And yeah. what do you do? I always like to ask this question. Um, what do you do when times get tough? You know, those really bad days, like what, what puts you back in your, in your state of balance? So as we haven't, uh, doesn't earn anything so far, so it's not that I had a million dollar loss so far. Um, mm -hmm. so when things go bad, honestly, the, the worst things that have been happening over the last year, it's just me with my depression phases because this couple of years, they, they really exhausted me a lot. Um, there's immigration, there's some family stuff happening and so on. So sometimes I just find myself in this low phase. Uh, literally last week I experienced a depression phase for the first time in many months. And uh, there isn't much that I can do about this because it's more of a malfunction of my brain. I just know that mm -hmm. I'm prone to melancholic and depression phases. And, the most annoying part about this is you, I start feeling very apathic towards work. My co-founder literally has a manual of what to do with me when that happens, mm -hmm. because I know that I still can work. My brain only allows me to tackle tasks, which describe like short action points. So if you tell me you dig a hole from here to there and you have to finish by midday, that's what I can do. Like it's, it's just a, an, an analogy, right? So it's a simple task with very specific criteria and timeframes and it's short. So mm -hmm. I just make sure while I'm, I'm still okay ish, but I know that I'm falling, descending into the depression phase. I try to break down my tasks that I have to do for the startup. Um, and I just make sure that my co-founder is aware that I am getting to my low phase. So she can remind me, bring me to do this task. And then that's how we do we get the job done. Those phases are not too long. They're just like a week long, sometimes more, but well, we're powering through. I was just wondering in how, you know, you and you co founder, how, how did you, uh, ladies, uh, I'm assuming it's a lady as well. Uh, how, how did you meet? 
So I wasn't blessed to find a co-founder while studying or working with someone. It's never been the case. Um, so it took some steps to find the person to work with. Uh, first person I tried to work with was at Anfer. So I went through the Venture Studio uh, Accelerator, Anfer last mm -hmm. year. And I went to attend it mostly for the fact that you could find a co-founder and fundraiser. Well, that didn't happen. I did work with one person for about four weeks. It was quite nice, but eventually we split up because uh, we were deemed non-venture backable, at least by Ember's framework, and he wanted mm -hmm. to try something new, and uh, so I let him go. So it was an amicable split up, and we didn't have anything to lose. And we'd only started mostly P2C customer research, and we're still using the results of the research. So that mm -hmm. was nice, but we haven't done much on top of that. And then after that, well, I took a break in the co-founder search because at Ember, I couldn't meet anyone else that would be sharing my vision and my passion for input while also having a complementary skill set. Those two things are widely important. Mm -hmm. Um, then I tried working with another person I met at the startup event. Uh, she had a complementary skill set, but I just had this constant gut feeling that something was wrong, that um, mm. just for whatever reason, I should not be building with that person. And when okay. at some point I realized that well, I can't lie to myself anymore, so I told her, hey, um, I think I'm going to just put this thing on the pause and just figure out if, if this vision that we're working towards is still something I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just take a break. And then next thing she messaged me was, um, yeah, I also thought that it's all a bit far-fetched. I'm like, well, that's not what I said, but okay. <laughs> so it's good that my gut feeling didn't uh, let me make a mistake of working as a person that didn't really believe in, in the idea and the project. Mm -hmm. And next one also found me through a, an accelerator network uh, guy, but wasn't particularly big on initiating things. So okay. it was mostly the kind of person we would really use at later stages, but at the early stages, I, I'm not great at delegating. I really need the person near me to step up and offer what they can do. And that mm -hmm. just, again, wasn't quite the case. So at some point he fell out of love with the idea. And I guess I wasn't great at getting him engaged early on. But by that time, I already met Alex, my current co-founder. Again, we met mm -hmm. just to start an event with an open mic. It was Rare Founders event. Uh, and I was I was hard to miss at that event because it was Halloween themed. And it was last minute Halloween themed. So, so very few people came dressed up. And I and I just happened to have a costume on my shelf, a costume of Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> For the next few, okay. yes, it's it's just a, it's a proper Alice in Wonderland costume, and I I, I pitched it in, into the open mic that evening. So for the next few months, whenever I started describing our startup to anyone, if that person was at that event, they'd be like, "Oh, you're the founder of a pitched an Alice in Wonderland attire." So that, <laughs> that that's a funny reputation to acquire. A costume competition at that event, so I, I got a meeting with an investor and a review of our financial model. So that was mm -hmm. not for nothing. Alex saw me, uh, came up to speak to me, and then we discovered synergy in our skill sets and, and, and passions. And then we met a few more times, decided to do a task period of working together. And over that time, I saw her as a person who shows initiative, who shows mm -hmm. responsibility, who's not afraid to challenge me when she thinks I'm not making sense, but in a very ethical and respectful way. And then finally, when I was very ill with very violent flu in January and uh, she offered to come and go with and E with me in the dead of night, um, despite the fact that I was contagious and she lives in the other end of London, um, I didn't accept her generous offer. Uh, I figured that really makes our humans, our relationship our, very much alike. And that was, that's what is important for me and someone I'm building a business with chemistry and the, the similar ethical and relationship values. Because, I mean, with skill set, obviously it's important to have complementary skill sets, but at the end of the day, building a business is not just about skill sets. It's also about having that person whose back you always have, if it makes sense. Mm. So, yeah, that was, I guess, the final straw that convinced me that it's time to sign the co-founder agreements. Interesting. And what are your plans for the future? Well, at first we try to fundraise for the idea um, and think about non-technical ways to do an MVP with like Slack or something. But then I realized that, again, the biggest obstacle so far is 
for me as a CEO who is trying to fundraise is absence of actual product. Like I just mm-hmm. did not feel like I am the CEO of the startup until we have a product. So I decided that fine, we're just going to invest a little bit into developing a low code version of the product and MVP slash a functional better version. So yep. we found an agency that specializes in that, uh, found an agency rather, I, I knew someone from the community who does that and uh, just starting to build an agency. So they needed some portfolio cases. They were, they were really willing to do it really, really cheap. We did, we started work developing the product and that's where we add. So, uh, um, since it's our first time doing that, and they're also amateurs as an agency. So it's, it's been delayed, but again, we're nearly there. Fingers crossed we're deploying this mm-hmm. week if everything goes well. And then once we have that, we're partnering with a visa agency that's going to offer our solution as part of their package. That's hopefully going to bring us first paying clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the B2B clients as well, because this visa agency works with recruitment. Mm-hmm. We have that direction, then hopefully we can raise our valuation a bit and uh, there and do our angel round, which is our main goal. Because honestly, then my imposter syndrome, the biggest obstacle is just time. Both of us are current, I mean, my co-founder and I, were both doing it part-time because, well, mm-hmm. early stage startup doesn't pay rent for rent, does it? So once we do fundraise, hopefully that will, will allow us to allocate at least most of our time to what we're building. Makes sense. And, you know, when, when you're building all these MVPs and talking with investors, you talked a lot about imposter syndrome. So how do you actually fight that? Because I think we all have that in one way, shape or form. How do you fight that? Because that's, that's a hard one, isn't it? I just go out there and pitch and talk to people and pitch on stage a lot. And I make sure to also talk and, and get feedback from people that are knowledgeable in the industry, startup in the industry, in the industry, and uh, just make sure that what I'm talking about makes sense. Right. We were talking uh, imposter syndrome. So let, let me ask the yeah, question again. Yeah. So, you know, there are lots of stories in the startup world about uh, founders that were never supported, that no one believed in them, that they carried on and built, and then everything worked out. As resilient as I consider myself, I can't imagine myself in the same shoes, because in my case, it's the feedback that I got that really keeps me going. It's because I mm-hmm. constantly get validated by people across different industries whenever they learn what we're building how it's going to work they love it and they encourage us and they and they still tell me personally as well how much they believe in me and that i make an impression of the person that can make it happen mm-hmm. like even our current partners the visa agency that is waiting for a release and is cheer- cheerleader really uh, they came because of me, because of my post, because of my efforts, so, so because of my personal brand. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really helps me keep going. It doesn't help me fight the imposter syndrome, but it does help me go on despite that voice inside of me. You know? So mm-hmm. nothing really helps cure imposter syndrome, but there are ways to prevent it from getting in the way. Interesting. You know, you're building something that's... that's uh quite useful for any immigrant and uh, we nowadays I think immigrant is a dirty word people look upon it with some um, some negative connotations but in reality it's actually the, the opposite right I'm an immigrant you're an immigrant as well and uh, it's actually a good thing it's not a bad thing for any economy but it's a uh, it's hard one. did you ever met anyone who told you, you know what why are you building this we already have too many immigrants because now there's elections about happening in the UK and that's one of the topics that ever anyone ever told you that so I didn't have exactly that. I, do, I did have a couple of people tell me why you're calling it an assistant for immigrants when in fact you should be building for experts and saying experts because mm. as you just uh, referenced it, the word immigrant often has a negative connotation. Yeah. And I even made a whole post on LinkedIn. It performed quite well. Uh, and, and I did have a couple of arguments in my uh, DMs about that. that like, but there is a difference between immigrants and experts. To which I always say, well, it's very relative. And, you know, sometimes this division sort of makes sense, but most often it's used to specifically separate the good immigrants versus bad immigrants. Mm-hmm. And whenever the question of 
good immigrants and bad immigrants arise. I always think of my father, relocated to Japan in the early 90s. He was already a PhD with a few dozens of books published, uh, with one book on um, Oriental Martial Arts published in Germany and being one of the international bestsellers in, in, in its niche. Just having translated and, and studied so many Japanese books from Silver Age literature, like not every Japanese can read these books these days just because the language mm -hmm. changed after the Second World War. So, he, and he was teaching at the university as a professor and, you know, with, with, with the track record of his, he was kind of worthy that position, wasn't he? But quite a few of his former colleagues went out of their way to push him out of that position and to do everything that would take them to strip him of that job and, and constantly get him and thus get him out of the country just because they did not want an outsider, an immigrant, to take over the job that only the locals were all worthy of. So that was the sentiment back in the early 90s. Yeah, I always recall this episode because for them, he was just yet another bad immigrant that was not deserving his place in their country. And I always remember that I usually being one of those good immigrants that like that no one has any well, well few people have anything against so i can be just I, I can just as well be a bad immigrant to someone despite the fact that i have uh for education master's degree speak five languages um work with clients from all over the world and so on to someone i'm still that bad immigrant that has no business being in, in this country so i would never in myself any better than less privileged people coming from less privileged backgrounds also moving to have a better life because essentially that's what we are that's the reason why we're all moving countries just to have a better life yeah. better opportunities it's just that some of us are doing it from more comfortable point a and some just don't have that privilege and and most often we really have nothing to do with that privilege in the very beginning we're just simply born in social conditions well not all of us but most of us yeah and it makes a huge difference when you move country because the access you're going to have to resources makes a big difference the, the first house you get the way you present yourself the way you speak the, the the foreign language um these things make a big big difference and even every time you have a setback if you're in a better financial position that setback it's not life-threatening but if you're in a bad financial position, then it becomes this, you know, make it or break it situation, isn't it? So, so it's a very interesting thing. Yeah, immigration is, is an interesting topic. So you have the, the app almost, almost ready. So it's going to launch in the UK. Are you thinking about other markets or is it just going to be in the UK? Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to follow the philosophy of Y Combinator, which is build the things on scale. So we really want to get things right for one location at a time make sure that we're serving our customers well and that um, we're our actual delivery value. And it is a business that is sustainable mm -hmm. uh, in business terms. And then if it all works, or at least we ha we see the first signs that it's working, then we would definitely want to scale it to other locations. Interesting. And, you know, your feedback so far from investors, I, I know it's been quite positive, but did they tell you, yeah, we actually believe in this and we can see the market for it? Or on the other side, are they more, yeah, show us some figures and then we'll invest? What's their feedback so far? Uh, I'd say generally from the conversations I've had, it's been more positive than negative. We, we do have some investors in the loop that want to keep, want, want to be kept in the loop for, for um, updates because simply because the checks they write are bigger than what we're looking for at the moment. Some are not convinced enough about our future traction, so they want to see a bit more evidence that it's actually going to work as a business rather than a social enterprise. Mm -hmm. So they're not slamming us, it's just that they need a bit more evidence generated, which is fair. Mm -hmm. Investors want to see more impact in metrics and specific figures, and that's also something that we need to produce. So not just saying we're going to help people, but rather how exactly that help is going to be measured. So one of the reasons, one of the things that we're doing to tackle that is we just landed um, a place in the Good Tech Ventures Accelerator, which is specifically oriented at impact-minded entrepreneurs. 
Hmm. And it's not focused on fundraising, but rather it's focused specifically on traction in the input sector. And we're hoping that a bit of mentorship from their side will help us produce the metrics that specifically input investors are looking for. Yeah, so far, I think I've only had maybe a couple of conversations with investors that deemed us completely non-VC backable, but that's fine because we're not looking for VC investment at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I would rather not have that pressure for hyper growth at the cost of our mission. And then, you know, if, if, if everything goes well and we are growing as a business, then that's when we would probably be looking into VC capital. Also, so I'm, I'm just trying... Oh, sorry. No, please go ahead. Also, I'm... I'm Honestly, whenever I see signs that someone is completely not a fit for us as an investor, that their mind is solely about, about the figures and hyper growth, just make sure not to ask them for money or even for feedback, just because it's a very different approach in philosophy. And again, with my imposter syndrome, I spend so much time just convincing myself that I am a startup founder who can do something worthy that I have no interest in hearing someone slamming me for that. All this harsh <laughs> feedback that Dean is talking about from VC investors, you know, the cost of money is my self-esteem and my overall ability to leave in the fact that I'm a startup founder than I'd rather bootstrap for a bit longer. <laughs> but it's, it's a bit, you know, matching with investors, it's a bit like dating, isn't it? You're going to get feedback one way or the other. It might not be feedback that you accept as valid. Some of it might be very honest and you would take as it being, I don't know, valuable. Other, you might just think, you know what, this is not relevant for me because these are not my values. So if you match with an investor who's just focused on hyper growth and you, you think to yourself, actually, that's not what I want to do with my company right now. There's nothing wrong in saying this is not a good match. Actually, that's what you should do, right? Uh, as a CEO, that's, that's exactly what you do. Yeah, also... You know, some investors are just great in terms of their communication ethics. And uh, yeah, I literally told someone off. I didn't even ask them for money, but like there was a founder of one of the startup accelerators here in London. We're not going to mention the name of that accelerator, but when I came into the office to just, you know, see the team and see if that accelerator is a fit for us. And then that person first demanded that I pitch our starts up to him right, right on the stop. Uh, usually I have no problem with that, but that even just was not a good time because I was feeling physically unwell and they were just yeah. so. And then just as I tried, he started slamming that idea that like it's a, basically it's a shitty idea for a business. And I, I just got, cut him off short saying, well, look, you haven't really asked him questions to know more about our business, our, our figures and vision, all of that. And you're already telling us that this is not going to work as a business idea. I don't think that's the right approach. I don't think mm -hmm. we're having a productive conversation here. And you should have seen a message in his eyes because I think he's so used to people just listening to his feedback and accepting that guns. Um, yeah, well, it's just a very arrogant, you know, I don't like the word mansplaining, but it was mansplaining, a lot of that in what he was saying. So basically he was just probably very unused to people standing up to that. And then his tone completely changed. And then we actually had a nice conversation. It was again, lots of mansplaining. He was suggesting things that were super obvious that we already thought about a hundred times, because I mean, that's our startup. <laughs> We've been working on it for a few months. Uh, so thanks for obvious advice, but if it makes you feel good and knowledgeable, fine. Interesting. You know, if you could change something in the industry overall, what would you change? What would I change? Oh, I guess something that everybody's talking about that it's really hard to get for female businesses, female, uh, female entrepreneurs. I guess that's a big problem. Again, I personally wouldn't be the person who can say, yes, I experienced that simply because I haven't done enough in terms of fundraising. Um, and I don't know if, well, actually I, actually, I would say it's safe to say that we didn't, receive any capital so far not because we're female founders but because generally we do have to work a bit more on our traction and stuff so but judging by what i see in the industry yes i guess more female entrepreneurs should be funded and we see a lot of female investor networks but what i've heard so far because female investors generally fewer of them have the capital to fund female entrepreneurs so it just creates this vicious vicious cycle where the problem is just not getting sold 
What else is, well, I guess what does need to change, well, at least that is changing in the industry. The question is how, uh, how strong the trend is, is more businesses should be ethically minded, more businesses should be thinking very early on about making a positive impact. And ideally, that positive impact should not be typical greenwashing, if you know what I mean. Mm. Because many businesses position themselves as impact oriented just because that gives them extra points at events, programs, and so on. But in reality, that's quite often it's not the case. So I wish that we had more clear labeling for impact and more businesses genuinely interested in making the said impacts, just not, not using it just a fancy label. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I, I, I like asking this question, but uh, what's your what's the most inspiring book you've read that really helps you in this journey? The one that you know you keep on when you have dark moments, you keep on reminding yourself of the, those lines you read or something. Um, in terms of my work, uh, could be a film rather than a book. It can be a film, one hundred percent. Um, just trying to remember the name. So definitely in my work, especially because I watched that film when I was working in a cancer care startup. So that was this film, a documentary, um, and I think it's called Breakthrough. And it's a film about the life and the discovery of a scientist. So her name is Allison. Just trying to remember it. Was it George Ellison? So anyway, the film is called Breakthrough, and it's about the discovery of immune therapy in cancer. Mm -hmm. And when you watch it, you're taken through his life journey where he spends, and I do mean a few decades, research trying to discover immune therapy. It was, load, it was lots of failed clinical trials. Like clinical trials, it's incredibly expensive projects with funded by pharmaceutical companies but so getting investment for those clinical trials extremely difficult and then imagine doing those projects one trial after another failing and going on for decades trying to make a dif make a difference by discovering something that cures cancer not really knowing if you will ever be able to do that because like when he was doing those the, that research, he had no way of knowing if there is actually a cure that he was searching for. Um, and then eventually did discover the, the therapy that did cure cancers, even from like fourth stage with um, metastasis in, in the brain. And, and the, the documentary featured people cure, who were cured in those early clinical trials when there was no way of knowing if that would work. So I found that really inspiring. I guess that the, that documentary is one of the reasons why I'm, I have a soft spot, not just for health, but also for biotech. I love biotech. I feel like it's such a romantic and inspiring world because, you know, what, what's at stake is the different future for humanity. But I, I'm not sure I would be the person who'd be able to sacrifice my life, decades of my life, in search of something that would never potentially work or mm -hmm. may save the humanity from something. Uh, but anyway, I, f I feel like it's, it's, it's really inspiring because it teaches you that sometimes all you have to do is just work and work and try and fail and try and fail. And yes, it can take years, but at the end of it, it can all be worth it. Hmm. Interesting. Jane, if people want to reach out to you, how can they do so? Uh, LinkedIn is the easiest. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, that's what, actually it's easier than trying to reach me even through my WhatsApp because in my WhatsApp I think I'm in too many startup chats and stuff. So, yeah, LinkedIn is the easiest. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, Jane. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Really enjoyed it too. Thank you. All right.